Today we are live, so good afternoon, I guess, or good, good evening, everybody. And today we we host Francesco Piccinelli Casagrande. As uh, as always, um, we will talk of uh, data journalism, but with a special with a special focus tonight on uh, data pertaining to. Afghanistan to several other subjects which, which are related to that. So uh, thanks for being thanks for being here, Francesco. Thanks for having me as always. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, yeah, a pleasure for, for us, of course. So where do we start from? Uh, do you do you have as always some piece of code to show us? Um, no. code, not really no, this no, time. No code tonight, yeah. No, 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 no code tonight. Um, tonight we are doing something more simple and, and I think also more, more interesting for the force um, watching us. Um, the idea tonight is to start from my latest story for the Italian uh, edition of Wired magazine, uh, which is uh, which uh, is the attempt of uh, reconstructing the. Uh, the story of Afghanistan since uh, 1989 in data. And we will use this, this story as a mean to investigate um, different kinds of data sources and more importantly, to have a, to, to have a general understanding of uh, how different data sets work and how different data sets are being uh, compiled, which is not yeah. always... Yeah. Let's share. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's share the uh, let's share the article here. So the article main chart is uh, okay. Is this one? Uh, this one is a chart that shows essentially uh, something like thirty thousand or fifty thousand. I don't remember the exact figure, but several tens of thousands of clashes in Afghanistan between 1989 and July the 30th, uh, 2021, which essentially means effectively, no, sorry, sorry, I did a mistake, 1989, 2019. Um, yes. Essentially 30 years of conflicts in Afghanistan. And this is, um, mapping conflict is something that uh, really pushes, in my opinion, uh, data to its uh, edge uh, because in this case uh, and in the case of the following data sets we're going to, to, to talk about, we're talking about um, data which is very fuzzy by definition and requires a lot of context to be fully appreciated and understood. What I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about um, the number of clashes that are there, which is a lot, which is more than 30,000. And also about the way things are collected. So let's take, for example, this thing. I, um, this data set comes from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And it is the first data set that tries to pinpoint conflicts on a map. Uh, one of the most powerful tools of this data set uh, is that it tries to figure out which are the parts fighting. In this case, I put in evidence Afghan government and civilian. Uh, what we see here, um, we see a lot of information about this thing, uh, which is something that happened in 1998. Masari Sharif, this is when the, um, when the Taliban, who were ruling Afghanistan back then, hence Afghan government, uh, conquered the northern city of Masari Sharif. Uh, and here you can appreciate a lot of stuff, the number of deaths estimated, uh, who is who is fighting in detail, and above all, how long uh, this, clash is la this clash lasted, which means essentially two good days of fighting that yielded something like 1,700 deaths. Yes. So th this data set 
is this as I said, is very complex and um, it's very good, but it's not the only way you cannot you can uh, portray a conflict. Another extremely effective way. By, by the way, by the way, I will I will share the link to your article and uh, yeah, uh, in, the, in the chat, yes, and as a comment to um, to to Facebook. Absolutely, yeah. you have it in the in our yeah, in sure. our pri in, in in our private uh, sexy chat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is one of the ways you can you can represent a data set a, a conflict in data. Uh, if we go to another data set, which is the one um, I used to portray the most recent situation in Afghanistan. And this data set that theoretically starts from 2017, but because I was using the other data set, I couldn't allow myself to have overlaps. I will explain this in better detail because it's, uh, it's slightly more complicated than it sounds. So the idea here is that this is another data set. This is, this is produced by this institute, which is called ACLED, uh, which is an attempt to pinpoint clashes and political conflict all over the world in real time. It is a massive effort. Uh, it partially stems from the data set we saw earlier, because the academic paper, the foundational academic paper of the two data sets is essentially the same. And it's a paper written yeah. Uh, by political scientist Havard Hegre, who is who, who, who is not the nicest person you can you can meet. I had the chance to meet him and to have some talks with him in, a few years ago. He's not the nicest guy you can have uh, a chat with, but he's extremely good. He's extremely focused. I mean, he he's he, he's crazy. He's crazy. Uh, he's like if you want uh, if if you like Formula One, is uh, is the closest thing to to Kimi Raikkonen you can have. Uh, in, in political science, because all of this is a, a subset of political science because it's conflict studies. And conflict studies are a part of political science. Uh, because conflict is inherently political, quoting Clausewitz. Um, what we have here, though, is another data set that uses different methodological tools. Not different methodological tools. Uh, it has a different methodological philosophy. Let, let me put it like that. If the, the data set I use for the first map um, is about uh, showing uh, battles and conflicts um, during all their temporal length. So if a clash start, if a battle starts, say, on October 19 and lasts until October the 30th, it's one event. Here we have a more fragmented and maybe also more realistic picture because you have clashes here uh, which are clashes is something that happened there are people that shot each other there are clashes that can be put under the battle taxonomy but nevertheless they are still single events uh, and uh, on one hand having this kind of different data sets uh, is a bit complicated because particularly when you do the ugliest thing you can do in the world, which is body counting, numbers don't, don't adapt. It's a nightmare. So uh, you have this estimation, uh, which comes from the Uppsala conflict database. This estimation is essentially, I'm trying to figure out how many people died in Afghanistan during each presidency since 1990, 1989, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go all the way to 2019, so it's still the 30, 30 years. Uh, the, when, you, when you use the data from Upsal, you get this number, which is, I mean, essentially astonishing because you are talking about 30,000 casualties uh, in 2019 only which essentially means, let's say, a city like Rimini in winter, when there is no tourists. Um, and, but when you try to do the same, and I'm telling you by, I didn't do here, but I can tell you by experience, when you try to do the same with the um, ACLED data set, you get numbers which are bigger because um, 
when you collect data in this way, which means using open source intelligence, yeah. um, you the have... The right? Eh, kind of. Because, yeah. I mean, uh, the... Um, and the Akred and Uppsala, they use the same... They, they um, roughly use the same methodology to collect data, which means uh, looking for local sources, government officials, um, well-known news outlets to have a sense of what happened where. Uh, the problem is that the two data sets have very different trade-offs because uh, the Uppsala conflict data program is more addressed to the academic world, which means that they need to provide the user uh, um, a more uh, um, nuanced and context-aware representation of conflict. Uh, ACLED, which tries to work in real time, uh, is a more loose in uh, letting conflicts and events into their own data set. Uh, for example, in order to get into the Uppsala conflict data set, data set, you have to have a minimum threshold of death. And that's why, for example, when you go backwards in time, because they also have a data set that starts in 1976, uh, if you go there, you don't see what happened in Italy between 1969 and 1993, the different wave of, the waves of terrorism that uh, struck Italy, simply because um, not enough people died, which is something that uh, would uh, perfectly fit within the ACLED, um, the ACLED criteria, I think. Uh, in case the bomb, bomb exploded in Italy today and made zero death, that uh, event would almost... Not be recorded. Say, no, would be recorded in the ACLED, mm -hmm. but not in Uppsala Conflict Data Program. Which means that the Uppsala Conflict Data Program doesn't see a lot of events. So... Yeah. We, yeah. And this is interesting because it shows you how data sets are built, the methodological trade-off they have to achieve in order to, be, to build a sensible representation of reality, and also a sensible representation of reality which is relevant to their audience. Uh, ACLED is more interesting for people like me because it gives you near real-time representation of conflicts. If something, something explodes, you have... Uh, immediately the, 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 the uh, you, you have immediately the, um, uh, this, the, 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 the small point uh, popping out in the charts. Uh, we can see essentially, I, I think uh, going to see the website of these, uh, of these think tanks is uh, very interesting. Then we go also to see um, other stuff because I mean, these are not the only data sets I use. And, uh, uh, so, Akled, 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 where are you, Akled? Uh, there we go, Akled. So, you can see what it's like, you know. So, it's clear that there is also Italy. Do you have news of Italy being in any kind of conflict so far? We are not at war in this moment. Yet some stuff happened in the so time. Which frame kind of fatalities are there? Let's check. Riots, couple of bombs, riots against civilians. Yes, maybe, but but which is the time frame here? Because maybe they are referring to Genoa or something like that. No, no, I don't think so. Ah, it's no. twenty. It's twenty twenty. Yeah, exactly. I can see, I can see. It's, it's Third 2020, quarter 2021. Yeah. So, there, so there, have been, yeah. there have been in Italy more than 100 casualties. No, to, no, 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 no. Zero, zero fatalities. Ah, zero, zero yeah. fatalities. Oh, okay. But 184 total events between oh, July okay. 2020 and July 21. Okay. Uh, this give you, this alone gives you the dimension of how uh, sure. loose are the criteria. Something like that would have never been possible in um, 
in in the other in in fact we go to see it we can go to see it and uh, we just find out what i'm telling which is that yeah you know it may sound it can sound very you know very unsettling but if you think about it we had public demonstration where maybe uh people demonstrating were were hit there's something that happens so this is the the thing this is the this is the the um, the data set from uh, from the ucdp and it starts this is the Uppsala data set this is maintained by an amazing department which is the department of political science of the university of Uppsala. it's something it's, it's, cra it's crazy. I mean, what they do in social sciences within, in the United Europe is something out of this world. It's something that we on the continent, apart from the Netherlands and Belgium and some other parts of the world, we don't do this. Uh, and yeah, we see this, no? Okay, and you have terrorism. You have the, um, the, um, the, the attack of Nice in 2016, we had the six deaths as one-sided violence but as far as Italy is concerned between 89 and 2019 there is nothing and this gives you the dimension of how of the trades off that different data sets need to achieve in order to be you know valid and um, and sensible because otherwise you know uh, it is a uh, something goes missing. Uh, another problem of this kind uh, comes when you talk about drones. The two data sets we examined so far are not very good in working in showing drones. Um, and that's why in the story I had to resort to a data set which is compiled, which was compiled by journalists. Uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, had a drone project um, which was discontinued at some point. But if you go to see the data set, you discover that it had a number of problems on its own. And for example, uh, in this data set, I decided to use drones, but I decided to use uh, one part of the data set, which is uh, the part of the data set which is uh, where attacks are, uh, are um, accompanied by yes. an ID number. Okay, and I say it to the source, and I felt I had to do this this thing because this data set um, doesn't give you a precise number as far as I understood the data set maybe I'm wrong but this num this this data set doesn't give you a number which is uh, there had been uh, 2000 drones attacks in uh, 2017 it gives you a fork which is legit uh, but the problem is that if you want to have uh, a tangible proof of the drone attack, you just you just can't not trust the source, which is in this case is the uh, is this amazing, I have to say, uh, collective of journalists. But essentially, here we have a problem of bias. First of all, because you see that. Uh, when you measure the number of casualties, you have anywhere between 4,126 and 10,076 between uh, 2015 and 2020. Yeah. And the same goes for civilians. And this, in my opinion, poses a great problem in terms of reliability and the injuries. So, what I decided to do here was to do a reductionist work 
so that I was sure that I was not um, selling crap to the reader. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that forced me, and that, I mean, uh, forced me to have uh, um, less, less number, less people injured, but more importantly, um, a sensible methodology and a way to verify the number of strikes going to official website like that one of Sencom or the NATO staff and whatsoever. And I think that I used also another couple of data sets. I don't know. I think you have time to see them too, but, and uh, um, they are also interesting on their own merit, I think, because they are, uh, they are very relevant and they will be even more relevant for the future. And this one is, there is this project uh, which uses essentially the same methodology, which is open source intelligence. Um, which is, which is, how is open it called? Source I, I call it open source intelligence. Which but is, but uh, the project itself? So the project itself, I'm showing you the, I'm showing you the website in a second. Okay. It's called, um, uh, I am I, IDMC, which is a relatively new thing around, but it has a very powerful data set, particularly when it comes about explaining uh, explaining um, internal displacement dynamics and also migration in, to some extent. Um, and uh, yeah, if this thing is uh, 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 there. You go. Uh, there you go, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. This is an international project. You can see the who's fa who funds it. Um, you can see who funds it somewhere. Because they changed the website recently, but I mean, let's go to the, to the about us so that you are sure what you're talking about. So they are, they are an international project that tries to figure out how many people are without a home within countries. Uh, and they do two things. They have two different data sets. Uh, one is concerned about war. Um, another one is uh, mainly concerned about natural disaster. And also when you go to see, let's go to see Belgium because both of us live in Belgium. They have no data so far about Belgium. But I'm sure that the next year, uh, when they will update the, 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 the data set, there will, be, there will be some data sets, of, some yeah. data about the flooding. The sure. flooding. Yeah, yes, it's 2020, so it's probably, it not, yeah. it's not recorded there. No, yeah, but I mean, for example, in yeah, the Netherlands, next, next year, yeah. Next door, 4,000 new displacements for, the, for natural disasters. Yeah, that's a lot. You know, that's, that's a lot. And if you go to see, you know, the conflict data, the conflict data is, is just, you know, amazing because it goes back something like 10, 11 years and it gives you a nice, a, a good reality, a good um, measurement of what's, of what's out there. And also, I mean, uh, I didn't do experiments yet, but given that, for example, Frontex, uh, gives you data on uh, on uh, on who comes to Europe divided by nationality and route. I'm starting to figure out in the last few days if there is a way to use this data of internally displaced displaced people to predict the next uh, migration wave to Europe, because I think that somehow. The two, the two variables are connected and correlated. And I think it's pretty much the case because it would make sense because um, what the, if you talk about Afghanistan, the striking data, the striking, the single striking piece of data that you have is that at least since 2014, when ISAP, the NATO mission stopped fighting, the number of displaced people grew and 
this is the total number. Okay, we are we are in 2020, we're above 3.5 million, which means that if this curve doesn't flatten, it means that people are not finding new homes, which means that they have to go somewhere, and somewhere for them means Europe essentially. Yeah, probably. And as we know, Europe is, is already building fences and new, and new barriers. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Have you have you read the the, the, the article by Francesca Benedetti on for Domani today? Uh, um, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. not. Yeah, Tell yeah. There, there were the, well, the, 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 there's always uh, always this. Yeah, there were always been, but it's it's increasing. Uh, yes, yeah, this uh, let's see building of walls. At the eastern you know, border of Europe, so in uh, Poland, in Hungary, uh, and in the, um, also in the Baltic states, but the the government is now is building uh, new walls, um, barbed wire barriers, and so on to avoid, you know, to 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 to, to brace for probably for uh, people coming from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is something that is gonna happen, no matter how, no matter how yeah, sure. hard, how big are the walls, they will come. And I mean, there are also, I think, some juridical duties to obligations to, 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 to at least rescue these guys. So uh, uh, I think we have explored. Um, I think eighty percent of the of the data sets I. Uh, I use in this article. Um, I have to, to make uh, a few more remarks about the fact that this approach uh, in conflict studies and in conflict analysis also in, in journalism, uh, although it is something that it is better than uh, most of traditional reporting because most of traditional reporting uh, when it comes about war is essentially dead. It is too expensive, uh, and it's also too dangerous because I don't think that there are many Western reporters outside of Kabul in the moment in Afghanistan, and I sincerely wish that they are not there because, I mean, I think it's very dangerous now, and I'm told it is extremely dangerous. I know of NGOs that are um, now having problems in understanding uh, who to address in the new Taliban government because there is no government so far. So they have problems in figuring out uh, a way to operate in the future. And uh, besides that, um, this kind of analysis um, doesn't allow you to uh, build the context of conflict. And this is, I think, the criticism most people do when they see this kind of stuff, because they say, we don't know what happens, and we know, we see the numbers, we everything. And they are right, but they are right uh, until some 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 extent. Because when you uh, a piece of journalism is essentially traded off between accuracy and uh, language, because you can be you cannot go into the technicalities of a conflict of this dimension. You either tell the story of the milestones of the conflict. Or you describe the data. You cannot do the two things at the same time. And given that this pay, and this is a good thing because newspapers are not blogs. So essentially, there are lots of people writing, and you know, reading a website or a newspaper. The same thing. You can you know mix information together, and then get a more precise idea of what is going on. Nevertheless, there are limitations, which is uh, the lack of a context and the lack of uh, an historiographical, if you want, approach to, the, to conflict storytelling, which is something that is unavoidable on one hand. On the other hand, um, it is not a limit at all, but it is something that is very powerful about this kind of storytelling, because if you do data, you do data, you do numbers, you, do, you show people dying, and these are facts that people cannot ignore, cannot ignore once they learn them. So despite the limitation, I think that 
um, if the that if the different institution I mentioned so far keep collecting and putting data together, we can have a chance to to avoid an informational meltdown like the one we had uh, at the beginning of the war in Afghanistan, where we didn't yeah. know anything about what was going in the ground, and there were reporters like Maria Gracia who totally who lost their life. Yeah, and yeah, the, of course, of course. The passion is. And of course, we, we, but there are still people who yeah, think that data are not useful or that data do not exist, or people who ignore data uh, because probably uh, because of. You know, uh, no, le, 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 yeah, because they don't trust data, I guess. Mainly, this is the main, the main reason. And, the, 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 uh, most of the time, when I speak to journalists, uh, about data and data stuff, they tell me that, that, that I get the impression that they feel like I'm telling them something that they think they already know. Whereas it is not true because no one has uh, um, a glimpse of what goes on on the terrain. And this is exactly what uh, this stuff tries to do with many limitations, with many trade offs, but at least. It is factual and it is something that uh, gives you a glimpse of the magnitude of stuff going on. Uh, we are talking about something like more than 30,000 clashes uh, collected using a very restrictive methodology in only one country for 20 years. You are talking about 1,500 clashes per year, essentially. Okay, on average, it's a lot already. And this the kind of stuff you can have it only relying on these research institutes that do these as their job, as their mission. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you can build a, a narrative, all the narrative you want. And once I was studying the number of civilian casualties in Syria, uh until 2018 and i was told that what i was saying was ideological was ideological in fact say there are data okay that there are you can debate the methodology you cannot debate it that's crazy the body count per se yeah sure and that, 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 that that's pretty much it now i, I don't know mm, what, what to do the data but i i think that the sense of tonight is that, you know, it, it, you know, this meeting is that in a world that uses data and portrays data as a sort of the 21st century oil, we, 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 we need to, to start seeing the ins and outs of the engine this oil tries to feed. And I think that, uh, you know, conflicts are a perfect example to to show people how how data and how visualization work because because of the fuzziness and because also of the public interest and also because of the trade-offs they imply in 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 the data gathering and building and i can't hear you yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was saying that that's a lot of material to to think about, and uh, but I I guess that we will we can if you of course uh, if you are available in seven in exactly one week we can continue on this topic or uh, absolutely give it, yeah because with great uh, pleasure we, we with great pleasure you know we we received the guys at Dakar are back from vacation and let's try to see what what happened yeah. in the meanwhile if they can if they can see us but i mean yeah exactly so francesco thank you for being with us tonight uh, thank you for having uh, me and talk to you in a week bye yeah ciao